joining in um, a couple of tags. Uh, the first is Whatever I Want Monday with our lovely friend Dee at the Baby Patch. Now, um, Dee has been incredibly generous um, to this channel and to the Cubs. So do give us some love if you haven't already because she really does deserve it. She's a lovely, lovely person. She's full of life full of southern charm and honestly I, I feel really glad that she is one of my my dear friends in this community um, we're also doing Monster Monday with Gilly the Monster and for that I have my little Ziggy with me now Ziggy is a limited edition joker bear um that i got from vintage and when i got him he, he bless him he wasn't looked after very well he was a bit battered and a bit smelly but he seems to have recovered quite nicely and he is a total mummy's boy his favorite phrase at the moment is Uppy, mama, uppy. He permanently wants to be picked up. And I always give it. And I know people say you shouldn't, because you're making a god for your own back, but he is just such a gorgeous little man. I cannot resist him. And for our tags today, Ziggy's got on one of my and his favourite outfits. It's a beautiful um, turqu um, royal blue and white stripe um, romper with short sleeves, which suits Ziggy quite well because he's got very long arms. Um, and it's got on the front of it a blue sort of shaggy looking monster this beautiful turquoise dug egg blue monster that's a key carried on and he's got pink spots all over him and yellow duck teeth and little yellow paws it's cat kids swim originally it's not three months and ziggy absolutely loves it don't you little man yeah you do. As I say, if you haven't checked out D or Gilly the Monster, please do go and check them out. They're lovely, lovely people. And they deserve more subs, so do hit them up if you can. Another thing that Ziggy loves is story time. We read a lot of stories on this channel. As I always said when I had kids, that I would read them all the time and now I have the Cubs I have a perfect excuse so we're going to finish off our story Love Aubrey by Suzanne Lafleur. I meant to finish it off um, either Saturday evening or yesterday but I wasn't able to because my stomach was playing up again <laughs> so I apologise for that but make yourself comfy, grab yourself a hot drink if you've got one, or a cold drink, a hot, grab yourself an extra blanket if you're chilly or fan if you're warm. And as per all videos where I read, all copyright goes to Suzanne Lafleur and her publisher, which is Puffin. I own absolutely nothing. Um, if you give me a second, Folks, while I get the story up, I will see you very shortly.
Righty ho gang, we are on chapter 21, so here we go. Right, let's get this up there. Chapter 21. My eye is open. It was already a bit light in my room. Everything was quiet. There was a different feeling this morning than on other days. I am 12 today, I thought. I stayed comfortably on my side while I thought about that. I pictured my sixth birthday, the birthday of training wheels and Dad's hand on the back of my bike to make me speed along faster. I pictured my eighth birthday. Savannah and I played with my drooping party blooms. They were stocked and floor bound, and we popped them all by sitting on them one at a time. Savannah screamed and laughed at every loud bang. Then there was eleven. Last year, I closed my eyes to linger better on this in this memory. Thanks, an awfully grown up choice for dinner. Mum said, That's all right, Dad said. She can have it. We all can. I'm sure she'll want it with macaroni and cheese. Cheesy potatoes, I corrected. Dad smiled at me. He leans in for an Eskimo kiss. When he pulls away, he says, Steak and cheesy potatoes, then. Had that been my last Eskimo kiss? I can't remember, Sammy, I said out loud. I got out of bed and went to his bowl. He glucked, glucked, glucked at me. I care carefully, I pressed my nose to the bowl. I stood back up. How am I going to do this without them? I whispered. There was a knock on the door and I jumped. Gran opened it. Oh, good, you're already up. You're up already. Happy birthday. She hurried over to hug me. We have a busy day. Get dressed quickly. There's a special breakfast for you downstairs. There's a special breakfast for you downstairs. See you in a minute. She bustled back out. Graham's house was never messy. Before the party, she seemed to want to get an extra good dose of cleaning. She picked me up after school so that I would get home faster than taking the bus and handed me a list in the car. Hoover, dust, decorate. What's Hoover? I asked. You know, get out the Hoover and clean the rugs. What's a Hoover? The vacuum cleaner. All the vacuum cleaners used to be called Hoovers. Turns out Hoover was a verb too, because I hoovered all the downstairs carpet. I found a pink feather duster in the back kitchen closet, and then I pink feather dusted all the shelves. After cleaning, I got out a holidays only white tablecloth from the linen closet and put it on the dining room table. I found the packages of paper party supplies that they picked out that I picked out. They were all purple and silver, and I was setting places round the table when Bridget got there. Hi, she said. Can I present the streamers? Hanging the streamers turned out to be a two-person job. It involved standing on chairs trying to twist the strips, to twist the strips so that both the purple and the silver showed, and laughing hysterically. While getting it tangled, while getting tangled in the thin crepe paper, Graham in came in from the kitchen where she was frosting my cake to see what was going on. She laughed too, and then decided we could figure it out on our own and went back to the kitchen. Once we'd finished, the room looked ready for a real party. Bridget and I went into the living room and clapped on the couch, still giggling but exhausted. There was a knock on the door. I went to open it. 
Hi, Marcus, I said. Happy birthday, he said, looking embarrassed. Come on in. I bought you a present. Thank you, I said. Was it the science kit he told me about? I'll put it in the dining room with the others. Now, the crystal growing science kit that Marcus mentioned um, brought back real memories for me. because I had, I had several of those crystal growing kits in the past. Me and my dad used to do them together. We used to make them. And then when I grew up and I started going to secondary school, our science teacher, Mr. Lazell, may he rest in peace, he's no longer with us now, um, used to um, do a lot of crystal growth with copper sulfate in particular, which is a, a chemical that when you mix it with water and you do things like grow crystals, it comes out bright turquoise and blue, it's gorgeous. Okay, he took one step inside the doorway and stopped. It's this way, I pointed. Okay, Marcus said. He followed me into the dining room. Gran, I called, we're ready to go. We piled into Gran's car. I sat in the front and Bridget and Marcus sat in the back. It didn't take long to get to the pizza place. Gran told the waiter to seat us at our own table and let us order anything we wanted, and she'd take care of it. He sat at a separate table in the corner with a book. When we all ordered Sprite, the waiter brought us an extra picture of the soda. We began a debate over toppings, but before the waiter could walk away, Bridget blurted out, Bring us a large pizza with everything on it. Sure thing, the waiter said. And Sure thing, sure thing, the waiter said and walked, the waiter said and walked away before any of us could say anything else. Everything on it, I asked. What does that mean is actually on it? Everything, Bridget said. That way we don't have to decide, we can just kick stuff off. Everyone gets what they want that way. While we waited for the pizza, we propped drops of water onto our scrunched straw wrappers to turn any squirmy worms. And when we'd done that, all, to all those wrappers, we rolled them into wads and threw them at each other. We started getting really noisy and I wondered suddenly if Graham would be mad. When I looked up to check, she was smiling to herself while reading her book. There she was sitting alone with no food in a pizza place. But I don't think she was lonely. She looked happy. The pizza came. Whoa, Marcus said. The pizza had piles and piles of, well, everything on top of it. Are those meatballs? Marcus asked. All I see are green veggies, I said. Enjoy! The waiter said, passing out plastic oval plates. Thanks, I said. We each chose a piece of pizza. I don't like peppers and onions, Bridget said, pulling them off. I bit the point of my slice. Ew, cooked olives. Now, I love olives on pizza. I always get um, extra spinach and extra olives when I order mine. But then I'm an adult and a vegetarian and I've always had a love of flavours so that's probably why. Marcus didn't seem to have a problem with the pizza. He ate it straight as if it was just a regular piece of pizza. Bridget and I had piles of toppings growing on our plate and we pulled them off. Wait you she said as she spat something onto her plate. I think there's anchovy on this. She sipped her soda in and out. I think this was a bad idea. It was your idea, I reminded her, taking a long drink of soda. 
We set our slices down, even Marcus. You should have let Aubrey pick the pizza. Marcus said it's her, it was her birthday. I don't mind. It was fun to try. I said. The waiter walked by. Excuse me, I said. What can I get you? We need a plain cheese pizza. And take the rest of this to my grandmother. She'll like it. She's the lady in the corner with a book. It seems like you guys had a good time, Graham said. After we had got out of the car and were walking towards the house. I saw a lot of smiles and I heard a lot of laughing. It was fun, I said, leaning into her arm around my shoulders as we walked. What's that on the porch? Bridget let out a cheer. She grabbed my arm and pulled me away from Graham as she made me run with her to the porch. On the porch was a brand new, shiny, raspberry, raspberry coloured bicycle. It had a rainbow ribbon tied to the front vertical bar. It has gears and everything, Bridget said, pointing to the switches on the handlebars. And real handbrakes. This is from you? I asked, amazed. Bridget nodded. And my family. We thought you might have a bike in Virginia, but you need one here too. Dad says we can go bike riding on our own if on our own this spring if Gran agrees. Get on! I climbed on, but the seat was so high only my toes reached the pedals. Dad can fix it, Bridget said. Marcus was on the porch now too, admiring the bike. I think the phone is ringing, Graham said. She hurried to unlock the door and disappeared inside. In a few minutes she was back with the phone. Aubrey, you have a call? I got off the bike. Bridget hopped right on and gave a shriek as it teetered. Marcus handed me the rainbow ribbon. I took the ribbon and the phone into the kitchen. Hello. Hi, baby. It's me. I sat down in a chair. Hi, Mum. Happy birthday. Thanks. Doing anything special? Having a party. I took a deep breath and my heart beat slow to normal. How are you? I'm good, Aubrey. Really good. Good. I wrapped the rainbow ribbon round my fingers, rolling it tighter and tighter, and then I pulled it off, putting it spiral to the floor. You still have your job? Yeah. What's it like? I just help out at the house. I just help out at the house, you know. You play with the babies? Yeah, sometimes I do. And sometimes I talk to their mums. Or to the women, or the women who haven't had their babies yet. Some of them are really young and need someone to talk to. You talk to them? Yeah. You tell them about me? I do. I tell them all about you. How smart you are. How beautiful you are. How much I miss you. Oh, is it, is it hard? To see all the babies. Mum seemed to think a little. It is hard, she admitted. I didn't see much of the babies at first. At first I was just helping out in little week. Just a couple of hours a day. Cleaning and cooking, doing the laundry. Then they asked me to drive some of the girls to their doctor's appointment. And you did. After a few weeks I did. When it looked like they really like they needed me to, I got to talk to the girls then, you know, on the ride, and sometimes in the waiting room at the doctor's. So I talked to them back at the house too. Then I started to come in for a few for more hours, because suddenly there seemed to be so much to do. Some of the girls go out to get jobs, and we need people to watch the babies during the day. I felt a lump growing in my throat. I've got to get back to my party, I said. My friends are waiting for me. 
you know, for cake and ice cream. And presents, Mum asked. I could hear in her voice that she was smiling. Yeah, and presents, I said. I didn't open yours yet. Go get it, he said. I can listen to you open it. Pretend I'm at your party. I carried the phone with me into the, to the dining room, found the pink box, pink box and brought it into the kitchen. I sat at the table to open it. It was two books, one with large pictures about life in the Middle Ages and the other with stiff paper for you to cut out and little people and buildings to set up a, med a medieval town. You left all of your history books here, sweetie, she explained. I thought you might like some new ones. Thank you, I said. I'd almost forgotten about that me, the one who liked to learn about things in history books. Mum had me. Happy birthday. I love you, baby. Bye, Mum, I said. Thanks for calling. I hung up before you could say anything else. Bridget came running from the dining room. Ready, Aubrey? Come on. She pulled on my sleeve and tugged me into the other room. I forgot all the funny feelings I had on the phone with Mum when I saw the twelve glowing candles and the beautiful cake wrap. Bramad made me. It was chocolate cake, but it was chocolate cake, a chocolate cake, but outside it had smooth, pure white frosting with pink edges and lettering that said, Happy birthday, Aubrey! Marcus and Bridget started to sing at the same time. I was wrong. There were 13 candles. One to grow on. Dear Bridget and family, thank you so, so, so much for the bicycle. I love it. It was definitely my favourite present this year. I can't wait until it is nice enough for us to go riding. I know that Gran knew you were getting it for me because her present was a helmet. She did a good job keeping it secret. Thank you for being so, so nice to me. Love, Aubrey. Chapter 22 I sat in the living room, surrounded by books for a language arts report on Robert Frost. Oh, I remember doing him at uni. I had a stack of them in my lap and I was copying notes out of the top, of, out of the top one. Hi, Graham said as she came into the living room. Hi, I said. She found the remote control on the coffee table and shut the TV off and shut the TV off. Aubrey, I want to talk to you. Okay, I said, not looking up for my homework. No, I need to know you're really listening, she said. She pulled the stack of books out of my lap and took the pencil from my hand and put them on the table. Then she scooped up the poetry anthologies and biographies from the couch cushions, added them to the pile and sat down. I couldn't tell how serious this conversation was going to be. I couldn't even tell if she was happy or sad. I talked to your mother. I talked to your, I talked to your mother. Oh, we've actually been talking pretty regularly. How often is that? A few times a week. Oh, I felt that like the two of them were being sneaky with secrets. I think she's doing really well, Aubrey. Oh, yeah. Graham paused a moment before continuing. She wants you to come home. I didn't say anything. I didn't know what to say. And I think, Graham continued, if you wanted to, it would be okay. Are you sending me back? I said if you wanted to. You can stay here for as long as you like, you know that. But I think this is what you've both been working towards, isn't it? And if you're ready and she's ready, then you can go off if you then you can go if you like. 
I wouldn't just send you off either. I'll come down and stay with you for a while. And once the two of you were on your own, there'd be a social worker to check in and make things were make sure things were okay too. Over months and months, Graham had never let me decide anything. She made me move to Vermont. She made me get out of bed. She made me go to school. She tried to control when I got to see or talk to mum. And now she even let me make this big decision. Well, what do you think? I asked. Maybe she can make this one for me too. Bram thought for a few moments. I would miss you a lot, duckling. But I think you can look into your heart and figure out what you want. My heart was a confused place. All that night it jumped with excitement and intense happiness. I dreamed of mum and us together again. I dreamed it both when I was asleep and when I was lying awake. I missed her so much and there she was within reach. The other half of my heart was heavy and dark. It made me think things I didn't want to. It felt like being hungry or scared or lonely. I didn't know why my heart would have those things inside it too when it should have been happy. It's hard to hug a fish, but I tried. I carefully took Tammy's bowl and sat on my bed holding my arms around the bowl. I think he was confused. He fluttered his fins quickly. Maybe my arms around him made it dark, seem darker than he was used to. I'm sorry, Stankin. I said, I thought about Sammy. You've been with me a long time, haven't you? How long did beta fish live? Pet fish don't always hang around very long. Sammy had been good to me, living through the whole summer and fall and winter. A fish could die any day. Sammy could die any day. Don't leave me, Sammy. I whispered, but really, anybody could die any day, whether you were ready or not. It could be your pet fish, or your sister, or you. Nothing is the same forever. When will you, where will you be then, Sam? Did I need to hurry and get to mum because you never know how much time there is? Or did it not matter because we'll all be together again someday anyway? Bridget? Yeah? I have to tell you something. Bridget stopped spinning her swing. She'd been twisting the rope for a big push-off. But she untwined them and the swing hung straight. What? My mum called. She didn't talk to me. She told me. She told this to Graham to tell me. She wants me to come home. Oh, Bridget said in a very small voice. You have to go, right? No, Graham said I could choose. But you want to go? I don't know. Bridget turned to look at me. You don't know. You don't know if you want to be with your mum. I mean, of course I do. I really, really do. All I've been wanting all year is for things to be right again. Bridget looked hurt for a moment, then looked back and down at her tennis shoes, whose tips she circled in the dirt. I'm sorry, I said. I mean, I love being here with you too. Maybe your mum could come up here. You could both live with Graham. Bridget sounded like her idea was the perfect solution. Graham says that she and mum talked about it. And mum doesn't want to have you taken care of by another adult. She wants to have her own life. I had to think about how to explain it. It might be like if mum came to live with Graham, she would never be making things better, but staying in the same place. 
I don't get it, Bridget said. I don't get it either. Bridget shrugged. What's the matter? I asked. I don't want you to go away. We can still be friends. I'd come back to Grand's, of course. Not friends like now. Not like next door, every day kind of friends. You have other friends. Not the same. Bridget, I'm sorry. Bridget always tried so hard to listen, to understand. But now it seems like she was thinking about what she wanted. I might need to go home. She sat quietly, but only for another minute or so, before she got up, slid off her swing and said, See you tomorrow. I sat on the swing in our yard, in her yard, wishing that, the comp uh, that our conversation had gone differently. Maybe I shouldn't have told her at all. And then underneath we got the start of another letter. Dear Mama crossed out. You think you are ready, but how do you know? Chapter 23 Bridget and I sat on the bus in silence from the way to school and then through lunch with a rather confused Marcus trying to make conversation between us and then again on the bus back home. I told Grab I was home and dropped off my backpack. I walked to Bridget's and her mum let me in. I found Bridget in her room, furiously cutting cardboard cereal boxes into shapes and then gluing them together into structures. What are you making? A town, she answered. Can I help? Bridget looked at me with raised eyebrows, then shrugged. I got some scissors and found a whole box and just sat there with both in my hands, not sure what to make. I think I might stay here, I announced. It was hard to say that out loud. It made it feel like the truth, like I'd decided, even though I hadn't. Not yet. To my surprise, Bridget started to cry. It was what I said, wasn't it? She asked. Now you're not going to be with your mum because of me. She's going to be all alone and it's my fault because we had a fight. What? I asked. No, you have to go, she said, crying harder. Why? Because kids are supposed to be with their mums if they can. She sobbed. I told my mum everything and that's what she told me, that you and your mum should be together if you can, so go. I'd never seen Bridget so upset, angry and confused. But she was almost turning purple, she was crying so hard. I didn't know what to do. She turned away from me, to the wall. When she didn't turn back, I let myself out of the room and left her house. Have a seat, Aubrey. How is everything? Fine. I slouched into the chair in Amy's office. Just fine, just fine. I hear you had a big decision to make. You talked to Graham. She thought I should know. Amy let a pause hang on the conversation. I figured I was supposed to fill it. I don't know what to do, I said. Have you talked to your mother about it? No. It might help. That way you can both be clear about what you expect to happen. I shook my head. I can't talk to her. Why not? If I heard her voice and she asked me, I would say yes right away. I wouldn't think about it. I would just say yes. So can you think of a reason not to say yes? Yes. No. Sorry, I, I got confused. Amy smiled. That's okay. It seems to me you're doing really well here. And if you wanted to stay here because you feel safe at your grandmother's, or because you're happy with your friends here, or because you like school, that would be a good choice. On the other hand, it would also be a good choice because to be with your mother again. Because I know it's been really hard for you to be apart. 
you don't have to decide right away and your decision that doesn't have to be permanent. I hadn't thought of that. Something about that idea seemed funny though. I don't know. I don't want to just sit here and not decide because then I'll think about it every day whether I should just make a choice. And it would be so hard to go there and to find out. It, it was a mistake. I need to be sure. So you've decided to make a decision. That's good. That in itself is really positive. I'm back where I started. Of course you aren't. You may be in one of many places, but none of them is where you started. When I didn't take my turn to talk, Amy started talking again. Well, it seems we've come to a stopping point for today. My door is open to you, though, if you want to come back again. You have a lot to think about, and I'm here. Thanks, I mumbled. I held up my hand. Amy shook it and laughed. How formal! Even if you decide to go, this isn't goodbye. We'll certainly talk again before you leave. I nodded. It felt weird to say bye, even if it was just for now. So I didn't say anything. Only when I was out in the hall did I realise I hadn't even thought about M&Ms once while I was in there. Where's Bridget? Marcus asked when he found me alone at lunch. We're, we're not talking today. Marcus sat down across from me. Again? You guys don't not talk. You always talk. I know, I said. But not today. Marcus shrugged. He started to eat his hamburger. I picked up my can of soda to, put, to take a sip then put it down and started playing with the tab. I have to tell you something, I said. Um, my mum is doing okay and she wants me to come home. I don't know if I want to go yet, but I'm thinking about it. Marcus stopped chewing his hamburger. Do you need an ice cream bar? he asked. I think I need an ice cream bar. He reached into the pockets of his baggy corduroys and fished out some change. He sifted through it and then hopped up. He came back from the lunch line a few minutes later with two ice cream bars. The ice cream bars sat on the table getting melty as he continued to eat his hamburger and I, I continued to pull at the tab instead of drinking my, drinking my soda. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't know how to tell you because I knew it would make you upset hearing about my mum when... What? Marcus asked. I'm not upset about that. I'm not upset about that. What's the matter then? I asked. It's just that I would miss you, Marcus said. He looked at me while he said it, even though he never looked straight at people, but looked straight at people when he talked to them. Even though I was surprised, I knew I meant it when I said, I would miss you too. The doorbell rang. I got off the couch to answer it. It was Bridget. I don't remember her ever ringing the doorbell before. Hi, she said. Hi. She held up a covered plate. She handed it to me and I picked some of the foil. Cookies. He said, chocolate chip. Mum and I just made them. I should have invited you to help, but next time. Next time, I agreed. Come in. He followed me to the couch. She took off her tennis shoes and sat down next to me with her feet under her. I peeled back the foil and took a cookie. It was still warm and the chocolate was melty. It was baked just enough so that it was still really soft, just the way the best cookies are. Nothing had ever tasted better. Bridget watched me eat for a minute. 
Aubrey. Yeah. You're my best friend. I know, I said. You're mine too. Bridget was quiet for another minute. You don't know yet, do you? I shook my head. I placed, I set the plate on the coffee table and we sat still and quiet for a few minutes. Bridget? Yeah? Can I tell you something? Yeah. I want to go home. I really want, I really want to go home. Bridget waited, leaving her eyes on me. Sometimes I imagine getting the train back to Virginia. I ride down on the train by myself. Why the train? Why the train? Because that's how I got here. Did they really make you go by yourself? No. Graham said she would come, but when I imagine it, I'm by myself. And when the train stops at the station, I get off and I stand there and I look at the platform one way and then I look the other way for my mum and there's no one there. That's not going to happen, Bridget said. I looked down and spoke in a very small voice. I know, or at least I've been trying to tell myself that, but when I imagine it, that's what I see. Aubrey, it's going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. Bridget moved closer to me on the couch. She wrapped her arms around me and hugged. She hugged me for a long time. After a while, she got up. I stood up too while she put on, the sh put on her shoes and we walked to the door. Don't forget you're my best friend, she said. I won't, I promised. I held up her hand, offering her my flat palm. She pressed hers to it. When we lowered our hands, she said, Bye, Aubrey. Goodbye. After Bridget had walked off the porch without looking back, I shut the door. Chapter 24 Home Graham seemed to be giving me plenty of time to think, so I was surprised when late one afternoon she came into my room. You've got some meal? she said. Really? I asked, moving from my, not moving from my bed. Who's it from? Your mother. She set two envelopes gently on my bed. I didn't look at them, just at her. I sat up a little and reached for her before she moved away. I hugged her. I love you, Graham. Graham chuckled. I love you, do you, silly girl? Now open that stuff and see what it says. Open that stuff up and see what it says. She left the room, closing the door, and I scooped up the envelopes. The larger one looked like it had been opened once before and then taped up again. I opened it first. Four faces looked back at me. They, though they were extremely familiar, they also seemed to be from some other time and place. It was us. Me, Savannah, Mum and Dad. It was a picture I'd taken from Mum's room and left on the counter in Virginia. I set, set it down to rip open the other letter. My mother had written it on loose leaf. My dear Aubrey, not long ago I discovered and opened up a mysterious unaddressed envelope. Then I, then I knew where the picture in, from the frame on my dresser had disappeared to. Had disappeared to. I thought for only a minute before I realised that you must have wanted it. Even if that guess was wrong, I want you to have it. I want you to know that I am doing well here. I have put fresh feet in the living room and dining room. They are both now a sunny yellow. They look quite different than before, I have to say. I've cleaned up your room, but I won't paint it quite yet. I want you to choose your own colour. I like my job better all the time. 
it feels good to be helping people and the babies are, of course, delightful. I have full time hours now, which means I am working a lot, but as soon as you return, they will let me go part, back to part time for as long as I need to, so that we can spend some time together. Know that I am thinking of you for all of every day. Love, Mama. I read her letter three times. Then I set it aside. I picked up the photograph again and took it over to my desk, close to the window, to look at it in better light. There we all were, frozen in that one moment. So happy. I thought we were gone forever, but it wasn't true. My family would never come back to me, but I did have little things. Little reminders. This picture and mum still there and getting better. And my memories. Holding the picture in front of me, I closed my eyes. I could still see it. I could feel the memories right there, close. But they weren't drawing me inside like they sometimes did. Maybe it was up to me now. I thought about mum and whether I should go to her about Dad and Savannah and then I chose the memory I wanted and waited for it to fill me. I've been sick for three days. Mum said it's one of those spring flus. She said some people get sick when the seasons change. Maybe I'm one of those people, maybe not. All I know is it's Wednesday and I haven't been sick school yet this week. I'm sick of spending all day on the couch, but my pillow still feels good and the sheets are smooth and cool and standing makes me dizzy. Mum sits me up, makes me drink water out of a baby cup and still has for some reason. It only turns up when we don't feel good. The sick cup. Mama? Yes, baby? I don't feel good. You're sweating. You know what that means? I did. Dad always talks about that. That a fever happens and your body gets really hot. When you start sweating, it means the fever is gone. Get up. Come in the car to get Savannah. Shake my head. Mum pushes the hair back off my forehead. She pauses for a minute, holding my hair that way. Okay, you're not ready. Lie back down. I'll be back in 15 minutes. When I open my eyes, Savannah is there, watching TV. She wears a pink plaid jumper over a green shirt. Her sneakers are a baby blue high top with rainbows and clouds. Did you dress yourself? I asked. Mum let me, she says, not turning around. Mum comes back into the living room and announces, You're going outside. See you, Savannah. You too, Mum says to me. Yeah, we'll help you. She stands me up and I change into the clean clothes she has brought me, even my underwear, right there in the living room. Then she pushes me and Savannah, who is an armload of toys, out into the front yard. Let's clean house, Savannah suggests. I sit down on the grass, determined not to move an inch. Savannah opens her little portable dollhouse and starts handing me the tiny people from inside. A pale wooden boy with fuzzy yellow yarn hair, a brown wooden boy with black hair, a lanky, bendy plastic ballerina. These are the brothers and the sister, she explains. She hands me a squat plastic woman and a tall wooden man with string hair. Then she shows me a wine coat with a face drawn on it. Mummy, Daddy, Baby. Savannah, none of these people go together. 
They aren't a family. Savannah doesn't seem to care. They live in the same place. That doesn't matter. And they're happy together, so there. Too tired to argue. I set the children in their bed. I put my elbow on my crossed legs and rest my head on my hands. Dad's car pulls me into the driveway. I don't get up, but Savannah runs to meet him. They walk to where I'm sitting. How's my, how's my girl? Dad asks. What are you up to? Playing house. But Savannah made up a crazy family. Ah, that happens. But I'm sure it's very nice, right? I shrug. I shrug. Are you feeling better? Maybe, I say. Maybe, he echoes. Well, that's better than not at all. It's better than not at all. Though I'm nine and way too big for it. Dad picks me up, letting my head rest on his shoulder. You'll be fine, girl, he says. I love you, Daddy. Okay. I love you too. And me. And me. And me, Savannah cries from below when she holds, where she holds his hand. You love me. And you, Savannah, he says. Savannah squeals happily and hugs me round. I love both my girls, Savannah. Get your toys. She scoops up the doll house, the dolls into the house, shuts it and takes his hand again. Savannah looks up the steps and pushes open the unlocked door, not letting Dad go. I'm content with his arms. She carries me inside and nestles me back into my cocoon on the couch. Savannah sets the doll house next to me. Mum calls them to dinner and they leave me, but I hear them talking, eating, laughing together. Alone on the couch, I open the dollhouse and look at Savannah's, look through Savannah's little people, pausing carefully to look at each face, wondering if they could be, as Dad has said, a family that's still very nice. When I lifted my head up from my desk, I wiped away the tears that had run all over that had run all over my face. There wasn't more behind them. I was done crying. As I wiped the wet spot off my desk, my palms made a slight squeak. I rubbed the spot with the sleeve of my sweatshirt to make sure it was gone. I took the photograph and held it in my hand. I smiled at each of them, Savannah, Dad, Mum. Then I set, the, set it to lean against the wall so I could look at it when I wrote. Dear Mama, I know that you are ready for me to come home. I'm really happy that you want me to, but I'm not ready yet. I'm happy here with Bram. She's really good to me, even when I'm being a baby. I love school and I have good friends. I really want to finish the year at least. The family next door is really nice to me. My best friend lives there. Now here is like home. I miss you. I know that you miss me and that you love me and that you want me to be with you. I promise that I will come home to you someday. But I'm not ready yet. I know that you want us to be a family again. I want that too. I'm just not ready to leave the family that I have here. Please come visit again. I hope that everything is good and your new job is still good and you are getting ready for when I do come back to Virginia. Everything is going to be okay. Love, Aubrey. And that is where the story ends. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining in, listening to this story with us. 
thank you so much for watching, subscribing, for commenting. It really makes my day when you do. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate it. And Ziggy and I will see you soon for another story. Can you wave, Ziggy? Good boy. Bye-bye, everybody. Cheerio.